Hello and welcome to Flora Funga Podcast with your host, KK, yet again. I want to give a huge shout out to Shelby for leaving an amazing Flora Funga Podcast annual feedback review. That, it was just so sweet. I want to read some of the things off because I haven't gotten uh, feedback in a while. So thank you so much for supporting the podcast and letting me know how you like it. Um, it's it's kind of how I reframe how to do the podcast trying to make sure that I am tackling all the things that y'all want to hear uh so one of my questions is what do you like about Flora Funga podcast and Shelby goes very interesting and diverse coverage of knowledge soft tones kind people spreading love and education to others which I value in a podcast I truly feel like I found my people and so sweet thank you uh what could be improved I would love to learn more about symbiotic relationships with fungi, plants, trees, and or soil microbes. And I would also love to learn more about algae. I know it's a bit off topic from fungi, but it's just an idea. I actually love covering this topic. I love talking about symbiotic relationships with either plants, trees, and soil microbes. I do have a podcast on algae. I have a podcast also on spirulina as well. So that's a type of algae. But I would love to do more and more. So if anybody knows of even an algae farm, I would love to do an in-person interview and kind of see the ins and outs of how that career is set up. If you want to find all these episodes, just go to florafungapodcast.com. And I have a search bar at the top of the webpage. Just type in either algae, plants, symbiotic relationships, fungi, anything that you want to find a topic on, and it will pop up. That's one of my favorite parts of my website is that you can search whatever topic you are interested in. I really like how people use my podcast as like a a filler during their job or just kind of, you know, if they're driving and have some time to kill. So, yeah, she says that she listens to my podcast as a microbiology tech working with my beloved little baby microbes. So she listens to Spotify at work. So, yeah, thank you for leaving a review. Thank you so much for leaving some feedback. It's really appreciated, and thank you. So enjoy the rest of this episode. Microdosing, on the other hand, is a small amount. So we're talking like 1 20th to 1 10th of a dose. Mm -hmm. So if we were looking at that, you know, doing the drug math out, it would be (laughs) roughly 0.1 to 0.4 grams of dried mushroom. Welcome CJ to Flora Funga Podcast today. I stumbled across you on Instagram and I've been covering a lot of topics on microdosing and uh, psilocybe and just overall uh, mushrooms as medicine. And I saw that you had uh, an awesome guidebook on microdosing. So I wanted to give the listeners a little, yes, we love visuals here. Wanted to give the listeners a little insight of what even is microdosing and what are the benefits and how to do so. So could you give the listeners a little uh, background on you and how you got into Funga? Yeah. So, um, I am a third generation male nurse. Uh, My father and grandfather were both uh, psychiatric nurses. Mm. Um, I've been a psychiatric nurse now for over 20 years. And in the last uh, two and a half, three years, I've I've moved into a role as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So I've, meaning I have my advanced degree, uh, a master's degree in in nursing, and I'm able to prescribe. medications. I do therapy with patients. I have a probably a board of about 400 patients or so wow. here in, in Maine. Um, yeah. So I ended up uh, kind of stumbling into the world of psychedelics mm-hmm. about six years ago or so. I ended up um, having, actually, I came into it. I had a patient that came into my emergency department where I was working, who was acutely psychotic, uh, mm-hmm. first psychotic break. He was in his late fifties, early sixties or so, no psych history, um, no drug history, kind of that white elephant, um, trying to figure out what was going on with him. So at that point, you know, we went and did a full medical workup. We did a head CT, the whole nine yards started giving him medicine, um, wow. some antipsychotic medications and about 
two and a half, three days later, he actually came out of it. It was uh, kind of surprising. And, and I said to him, like, what the hell happened? What's going on? Like, this is unheard of, you know, because we had talked to the family and everything and they had no idea. And he had disclosed to us that he had been, he had gone and used a macro dose of penis envy mushrooms. Mm. Mm. Some of that PE. Yep. For his mental health. And this was, you know, so this was about six years ago. This was before Michael Pollan's book came out before the polarization of America, how to change your mind. And I was like, what the hell is this? What is going on here? Mm -hmm. So I went down that rabbit hole looking up what penis envy mushrooms were. In doing that, um, I was at work. And the whole time I'm going, as soon as the pictures came up, I was like, boy, what am I going to say to HR and our uh, IT department when they see what I'm I'm looking up? <laughs> yeah. And the the name alone is like, all right. That what are we going to get here? <laughs> it, you know, when you start looking that up, you know, I, yes, I'm in the medical field. Yes, I'm, uh, you know, I'm using their their system. But so it's not unheard of to be looking up these kinds of words. But here we go. So in that, I found um, an article written by uh, Hamilton Morris. It was uh, called Blood Spore, talking about uh, Dr. Stephen Pollock and his murder. Mm -hmm. uh, he was head of a uh, mushroom farm. He was raising money. And... Uh, to he had the strong belief that mushrooms were going to change the world and in one of his papers i think it was in 1974 came out saying i can see this being used for mental health and holistic purposes within the next 10 years mm -hmm. and that went down the rabbit hole because i was in school at the time also where i could so i could look up anything i wanted um in all of these papers so i went down started looking up everything that he had wrote i started going into as i'm reading it um what he was citing, so going into uh, Sasha Shulgin's work, Pical Tical wasn't written yet uh, when he published, but a lot of his work was out there. And I just started collecting everything. And as I'm reading this, I'm going, you know, I knew that psychedelics were, were something. I knew there was special. I knew that there was all of the research that was done in the 50s and 60s, but not to this extent. Um, so I really got into it and, and reading everything. And at that time, I was in, I was in school. Uh, I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. And I had to do a project on uh, something. I had to do a research project. It was a very superficial. It wasn't like a, a meta review or anything. But in doing that, I started like, Let's, I had to do a compare and contrast analysis of of like four papers. So I pulled a couple of papers from the early uh, 50s and 60s and started comparing them. Around mm -hmm. that time, also Michael Pollan's book came out, which made my research that much easier because everything was cited. It was there. I could, you know, mark everything up. It made it really smooth. It, um, I bet the librarians that I was requesting this from absolutely hated me <laughs> I'm requesting all these papers from the fifties and sixties, you know, and I can just visualize them going into the, like the dungeon of the library. Cause I'm getting printouts from microfiche paper, you know, it's not electric. It's not. So I saved all of them. And now I have a shelf in my office. That's about five feet long of all these papers that were printed, um, categorized. So that it just was like, this is amazing. During that time, I, I, I the next semester, I had to do a project on psychedelic medicine, or I had to do a project where I had to do an educational project. I'm like, I'm already doing the psychedelic stuff. Let's do it. I had to do an hour long talk with my with my um, peers at, at work. And I did a paper about uh, a presentation on psychedelics and psychiatry. And it went amazing. Good. At that time, I was like, where am I going to go with this? And, and, and you know, the my... The psychiatrists I work with, the social workers I, I worked with, they had some background in it. They knew what was going on. They're you know close to retirement. One of my psychiatrists I work with, he was actually um, donating for MAPS from the beginning and was actually looking at sending a patient to Montreal to get Ibogaine back in the 80s for um, opiate use disorder. So it wasn't too foreign to them. Mm -hmm. So I ended up putting that, paper, uh, that presentation, I threw an abstract into the uh, American Psychiatric Nurses Association's National Conference. In doing that, it was picked as a uh, picked as a uh, podium presentation. Um, in doing that, it was I found out after it was the first time they had ever had psychedelics at their conference, even uh, talked about. And here I am going to, I believe it was New Orleans or or Ohio, wherever I was going to present, and I'm sitting there going, 
I'm committing career suicide. Like I'm going, I'm going to be going to talk in front of all these nurses, these uh, psychiatric nurses, substance use nurses, talk about the pro use of drugs. I didn't even tell my school I was going when I was, when I was getting ready to go. And the other part that was kind of interesting is about six, eight weeks before I went to go do the presentation, the conference reached out and said, hey, we're going to be putting this into the pharmacology uh, route of the conference, which as a advanced practice nurse, when we do our renewals, at least here in Maine, out of the 75 hours we have to do, I think it's every three or five years, 25 of which have to be in pharmacology. Okay. The only place you really get the pharmacology hours are at conferences. So mm -hmm. they're the most heavily attended at the conference. So as I go to the conference, I go up into the front of the room and there was probably 500 people in this room, standing room only, people sitting on the floors. Like it was absolutely ridiculous. And I was just like, so this is what imposter syndrome feels like. That yep. was how, like, that's all I could say. I, I said that in the opening and kind of everyone kind of, it, it had a little levity to the room. And I was like, here we go. Mm -hmm. And I found during my talk, like I'm talking about the studies that were going on and how safe psychedelics can be um, the kind of dis discrediting, you know, the, the war on drugs from the eighties with the, this is your mind on dr uh, drugs with the frying pan, and the egg. And as I'm talking, I notice there's this pockets of nurses out there that were retired, close to retirement, you know, not no ageism, but 60s, early 70s. They're just nodding, going like, we know this, like, wow. we know this. You guys are coming around to this. So after I got off the talk, uh, off the uh, talk and had the Q&A session, I had people coming up to me the rest of the week just going. Oh my God, that was the best talk I've ever seen. I've never had this going on. I felt like I was a safe person where people were coming up going, I participated in Spring Grove research in Maryland back in the 70s. I've worked with maps, like all of these things. Uh, and it was actually kind of funny. My uh, my ex and I were at this art market where they were selling some of the extra, some of the art I have behind my head. And it was like midnight. And this group of nurses come up to me and go, hey, you're the mushroom nurse. And I was like, Yes, I am. And that's when I realized I wasn't committing career suicide. Like, I'm on to something here. I'm going to run with this. And that changed my career from that moment forward. Wow. My professor at school actually came up to me afterward and go and says to me, we need to talk when you get back. And I was like, here we go. So we got back because uh, I didn't know. I didn't tell them I was there. And they were like, that was amazing. Can you do the talk for our class? The rest of my my college career, like I had to do a, a, a research paper uh, and a presentation the next semester on types of psychotherapy. So, you know, CBT, DBT, um, Gestalt, all these different things. And they were like, are you going to do psychedelic psychotherapy? And I was like, I wasn't thinking about it. So they're like, can you do it? We want to learn from it. And I was like, I'm, this is just amazing. So after that, I ended up... Um, going and i've gone back i went to the cis um certificate program the their certificate in psychedelic studies and therapy uh graduate from there i've done a lot of work with psychedelics today i've educated with them i've i put together um psychedelic dot support they have a eight or nine hour course on on psilocybin that i co-authored in there like all these things just started coming into my lap and, uh, and i'm just like i guess this is what i'm doing now like this is kind of fun i'm enjoying this yeah. with so then after all of this is set and done after i'm all you know now i'm working i i i was open with my mentor in school about what I, I do and my, I was actually writing my book at the time. And afterward I'm here in my practice and my, my mentor says, reaches out to me, goes, I've got a patient that's interested in, in psychedelics. Would you meet with them and, and talk about this? And I'm going, I'm more than happy to, and I'm trying to figure out how do I legally do this? How do I go about this? How do I navigate this space given the legality? And the, it went awesome. I, I kind of put together like this idea of, you know, why can't we talk about, you know, smoking cessation, alcohol cessation, um, cutting down opiate use and, and needle exchanges and safe use? Like, what is the difference with psychedelics? Why is this not? So I, you know, came up with the idea of, of 
documenting so it's there to kind of like cover my ass of mm. you know the patient came to me talking about it um as they came to me i'm giving here's the research that's out there i'm not saying you know that i'm not condoning what they're doing i'm not giving them uh, a ways to access i'm not breaking any of that but if theoretically if they were to go out and do this on their own mm. here's how to go about doing it safely gotcha and the that patient they gave some great feedback to the mentor and loved it and they asked me if i would do it again and now i i kind of i don't want to say i officially do it for for my hospital i work at but um it's kind of like this don't don't ask don't tell like they'll send people in the hospitals just like we'll let you do what you're doing over there oh. so it's really been a lot of fun it's it's an interesting kind of way um and as I've been doing more talks, more conferences with it, and, and and people are, it's kind of nice to be able to have this changing the stigma, changing how we go about it and everything. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great outcome that people are coming to you to talk about something, especially when you were kind of scared to even, you know, make that your presentation. And now people yeah. are like, we want you to talk about this. Imposter syndrome, you know, fades a little yeah. bit. <laughs> and, it, and it kind of reinforces the fact that, you know, I'm not committing career suicide. I'm doing something right. Yes. Which it, you know, I had that every project I had before, something would come up and I'm going, how is this going to be received? And now I'm just like, mm -hmm. well, this is, this is it. This is, yeah. what I, I'm coming in. I'm, I'm doing this. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What is the kind of the rules in Maine for psychedelics? Um, it's not legal as of right now. I've actually testified with the state twice now for legalization. Okay. Uh, we're going to be actually by uh, starting up uh, legislation. Uh, legislative session just came back a few days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're actually going to be starting a, a, a pretty big campaign. We've got some... Uh, it, we did it once. We went through with it once, and it failed. This now we're going through it again. Now we're going through the veterans committee, and we've got uh, a lot more support. It seems it, like we knew it was going to fail the first time, but it kind of at least got it the conversation out there. Mm -hmm. And now it's uh, it's different. Like the first time we had a bunch of medical associations come out kind of against it and and didn't want uh, didn't want to see it, and now we haven't had anybody really come out and against it that's we are the cannabis industry has and the cannabis movement here in maine came through and that kind of helped where people have seen that it's not as big and scary as as what once thought mm -hmm. so yeah i, I so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to see it here in maine i'm hopeful that uh as we're starting to get, you know, they just became decriminalized uh, a couple of months ago in Portland, uh, Maine, which is exactly the same way cannabis came through. Gotcha. And and we haven't seen any problems with it yet. Yeah. Like there has been zero, which usually is the case, you know. So it's we're hopeful for it. We'll see. Yeah. And have you been working with Decriminalized Nature at all? Do you know of that group? I know of them. I, I've been uh, in conversation with decriminalized Maine, not decriminalized okay. nature in 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 general, um, but decriminalized Maine more locally here. And we've got some pretty good lobbyists that we're working with. Okay. And yeah, we, there's a couple of groups that are you know working in concert here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cannabis still in Florida is very uh, a no go kind of in a way too. So it's it's so far away. Um, in Florida here, but like I was uh, just in Minnesota, they just legalized cannabis there. And I think next will be some psilocybin things and psychedelics in a way. Well, not to get too political. I mean, Florida's kind of got their own way of going about things. It's yes. kind of interesting. <laughs> it's a different, it's, you know, it's not even just like the, the Bible Belt or the South. Like Florida is just different. It's a, it's a different cat. Different animal. Yep. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> Nice. And I want to kind of dig into what even is uh, psilocybin in general? Like, is it just in mushrooms or is it in other psychedelics? Like, what is the main deal about uh, psilocybin or psilocybin? So the the interesting thing with with psilos, uh, psilocybin and psilocybin in general, you know, it comes under the classification of uh, what is a classic psychedelic, meaning that it works on the serotonin 2A receptor. Okay. Um, with other other substances that work on the serotonin 2A, uh, LSD does, 
uh, DMT does, mm. a few of these different uh, substances, but none of them uh, really come from nature per se, naturally produced. You know, there is some right. naturally produced DMT. I believe there's a sea urchin that, that produces it. You know, it comes from the uh, Buffalo Varus uh, toad. Uh, mm -hmm. But LSD, you know, it does come from ergot. But to actually get to it, you have to synthesize and, and get to that point. You just can't, you know, naturally have it other than, you know, there is without going into like the uh, Lucian mysteries and Krykion and, you know, there's some mind altering there, but it's very hard to figure out. The the one interesting and, and wonderful thing about uh, psilocybe and, and psilocybin is, is it's natural and it grows and, you know, it's one of the most uh, exciting things I feel with, with the mushrooms themselves is by being able to gr grow them, mm -hmm. it increases access and it grows yes. access to people. Like in, uh, I've talked to some individuals who, you know, during COVID, one of my classmates at CIS, we were having a conversation. She was a nurse, burn high burnout with the nurses, you know, during COVID with everything. Um, and she knew she, this was happening. She knew her mental health was struggling and because she was not set up with a PCP prior, she could not access a provider to prescribe her, her fluoxetine, um, search, lane, whichever the SSRI that, that she happened to be on. She knew okay. the dose, she knew what she needed to be on for an antidepressant, but no one was willing to prescribe it. So she ended up, uh, obtaining spores growing them herself and Whoa. started microdosing and had had as good if not better was uh results from from microdosing as opposed to you know conventional medicine wow. and that's the exciting part you see you know you know you get into these someone can grow it on their own you can have someone you know in a decriminalized area grow as a group and and do it mm -hmm. um it's kind of exciting to to see that out there as options where people can do it. You know, I, I speak of a little bit in my book where the the biggest uh, challenge or the most dangerous quote unquote side effect of microdosing is the legality and and having you know potentially being arrested and and being locked in a cage for a number of years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Um concerning it's yeah. probably uh feeds into the paranoia like that would be like the biggest negative thing too yeah there was a nurse actually um who ended up getting caught with with mushrooms for and microdosing during covid herself mm. uh, you know i'm not gonna tell the whole story that's her story to tell but it turned into a whole legal aspect of it and you know a few of us in the community came out and spoke for her um, in support and she was able to get uh, get things reduced down she, she still has her nursing license and it, you know it was absolute hell for her to have to deal with uh, in the challenges of it but you know that's the worst case scenario that that can happen and it came to fruition unfortunately so it's one of those things you know it is real to, to think about yeah yeah definitely how does um, psilocybin kind of compare to other compounds? Do they look kind of similar or? Other compounds. Um, so why, why I mentioned it, it's how it is a search it is an antagonist uh, agonist of the serotonin 2A receptor. Mm -hmm. if, if I had a visual here in front of me, if you looked at it, um, psilocybin, the, uh, chemical structure looks very similar to LSD, which mm -hmm. also looks very similar to the serotonin um, molecule, which is why it stimulates in that manner. It's okay. uh, very interesting, you know, naturally forming. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things for me. Uh, the question is, is why, why do we have a lock that, you know, in our brain and a key that's naturally out there? Right. You know, why us? What, why? meant to be i don't know, you know you go, and you know you want to go down the rabbit hole of uh, terrence mckenna and the stoned ape theory and all of that i welcome people to do it it's a you know something we'll never actually know the answer to but it, <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting thing where you know here's this naturally producing substance that grows and growing on you know every continent across the world you know in different species you know there's I don't even know hundreds of psilocybe mushrooms that are out there. Oh yeah. You know? 
maybe thousands. Alan yeah, Rockefeller thousands. just can name all of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, his oh, it's amazing. Some of the stuff like what where he's at and just kind of going out and you know, you get into these remote areas and in the mountains and stuff where it's like, oh look, we've never we haven't seen this before. We haven't seen this anywhere. Exactly. Um or the 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 story of uh of Paul Stamets where he was at a conference and bored and was walking around at this conference in Florida and he found a mushroom he'd never seen before. Right. There it is. And it was a psilocybe growing like naturally, like unreal. Yeah. No, you just find them. Uh, like even in our backyard right here, like you yep. just find one. You're like, Whoa, what is this little, just this exactly. little one, little mushroom. Exactly. So cute. <laughs> Magical. <Yeah. laughs> and like I said, with the access piece, you know, people can, they grow naturally, but you can, grow them on your own and and you know uh i'm i can't say how easy they are to grow but theoretically <laughs> um theoretically you know they can they grow on shit you know right uh, you know if, if you want to get you know easy tech you know i've heard of uh uncle ben's tech that's out there uncle as a way ben's. to grow yeah apparently people can inject into the Dollar ninety nine, Uncle Ben's, because uh, they're already oh, sterilized and grow I on there. See. Yeah, easy enough. It's already yeah. um like cleaned and exactly boom, good to go. It's got a little <laughs> higher rate of uh, of failure for contamination, but on the grand scheme of things, you know, you have to crack a couple eggs to to make an omelet, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, and it you know wouldn't take up too much room, so it's it's uh yeah. nice in that way. So I agree. Yeah. Hmm. Let's talk about your uh, guidebook a little bit. What even uh, inspired you to write your own book? Uh, so in the inception of, of my book, I had absolutely zero plan of writing a book to actually <laughs> be published. Uh, had I had I had that plan, it probably would have been a lot more difficult. And, and where am I going to go with this? But uh, so... After I had mentioned I did all a bunch of conferences and all of these talks, I had a friend that reached out from one of the conferences I was at. It was uh, Daniel from Mount Tam Integration. Mm -hmm. I had done the uh, psilocybin uh, conference in the first year. And he's like, I have a friend who's doing a microdosing course. She reached out to me. She was wondering if, if you'd have a conversation with her. Apparently, she's doing, she's a microdosing, uh, she's a life coach and doing microdose coaching. She said she's getting asked all these questions of drug on drug interactions, um, medical conditions. She doesn't know, would you, you know? So I met with her. We had a conversation. Uh, and so Tara, uh, Tara Lee had asked me, she goes, I'm doing this. I don't know. I'm over my head. I can go with like how to kind of dose this, but these are questions that are just medical. I have no idea. And there's really no one out there that's talking about this. And there's mm -hmm. not many people that are even, would you be willing to kind of jump into the conference and, and, and doing this uh, six week microdosing course? And I was like, initially I was like, I don't want to jump into something I don't believe in. Give me a little bit of time. I want to kind of you know, at this point, you know, everything I had read, at least superficially, was it is a placebo effect. You know, oh. I'd read a little bit of uh, the work of, of Fadiman and kind of going against it, but I never jumped in. I never really went down the rabbit hole. So I, she's like, yeah, take a couple weeks, you know, see what you want to do. And, and I started going in and, you know, as I had, as I mentioned, I had this shelf of research there. And what I found in the early 50s and 60s research they were doing microdosing research, but they didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So they were looking at these as, as it was the, the placebo uh, control. They were looking at and what they found in there was, you know, a threshold dose. So they knew something was going on, but they didn't know what, which is about 17 mics when it comes to LSD. Um, what is, you know, what does that mean? And, and, and there's stuff going on. So I, that's when I kind of got into Fadiman's work deeper and seeing all of it, which is, you know, anecdotal evidence, much of it um, at that time. And I just realized this is something that's really mean, meaningful. We just don't know it. Mm -hmm. And we're, since we don't know it, we're going to just classify it as being a placebo. Mm. And so I, I said to Tara Lee, you know, I'm fascinated with this. I would love to do this, you know, if we've got a, a cohort of people, you know, to help them and having improvement, why not? Yeah. Let me, let me jump in with this. 
So in doing that, I kind of came up with this idea of, I don't want to go in because we were meeting, you know, every week for like an hour and a half. I don't want to go in and, and, you know, everyone wasting their time, my time asking, you know, these basic questions. So I went in and I started putting together this little handbook and in this handbook, it was, you know, popular questions. What is microdosing? How to find your dosing amounts, mm -hmm. you know, all of those types of things. So when people kind of came in and I sent, I emailed it out to them, I said that way when they came in, they kind of had these basic and if they have questions from that, great, but it's not a me talking to them. It's more of a, a open conversation. Mm -hmm. So in, so in that, I, you know, I put together this, this pamphlet, it was probably, you know, 60, 70 pages, you know, at this <laughs> point. I mean, it was, you know, it was double spaced and, you know, all of these other things. We did like a, a, a six, a six week journey. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And, and so in the first talk, talk, I said to them, you know, I'm not your medical provider. I'm not giving you medical advice. You know, this is, you know, buyer beware, but I'm going to put in some of these specific questions of drug on drug interactions, things like that, and talk to your provider about it. Mm -hmm. And if they have any questions, print this out, bring this pamphlet to them, let them see it. And if they have any questions from that, they can look it up. And that's when I had that like proverbial light bulb over my head. And I was like, if this was my patient coming to microdose and they brought this to me, this is what I would want. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm onto something here. So at this point, I kind of started doing a little bit more work. And as I'm doing the the course with people, you know, more questions are coming up and I'm writing down notes and kind of adding stuff to it and kind of going, this looks amazing. Uh, at the end of that, I, I had, it was 100 and some 200 pages of, of a book. Right. And I started looking for publishers, um, which... This is also in the height of COVID when everyone was on lockdown and anyone that ever wanted to be a writer were able to be a writer and submit stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was working during this time and I was also a full-time student. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, it was not, I didn't have the, uh, it was not my, my number one project in living of life. But so I started reaching out to the publishers. I said to them, you know, I have a manuscript here. Like if you guys want to take a look at it and a couple of them were like, we want more of a, uh, a, a fictional or nonfiction and kind of telling a story kind of like, uh, mm. Aylett Wilet's book, uh, really good day. And I was like, that's not my writing style. Like here's this, you know, and I, and I had a couple of, of publishers who were very interested in it. And one of them was like, we love it. We would be happy to sign a contract and do it. We're printing three years out right now because of all of what we've got going on. If you want to do that, we're here. Come back. No hard feelings. If you find someone else, let us know. We'll just have this con you know, have this conversation. And uh I was like, okay, like that's that's amazing. And that's when I found a, a publishing firm, uh, Ulysses Press, that was interested in. It. I sent them the manuscript and they were like, We love it. Let's start kind of looking at this and kind of coming up with it. And back and forth, um, how we're going to go about it and editing and stuff. So the book is set up uh, in by three sections. Mm -hmm. The first section is, is for the person that has no idea what microdosing is, wants to know more about it and just they've heard about it and know, don't know where to go. And a right. lot of the information there, you know, I, I can, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants because I'm a lot of it is, is citing Fadiman's work and, and stuff like that. Um, which ironically enough, I reached out to, to, him, to James Fadiman before I even went to a publisher. And I was like, I know you don't know me. You have no idea. Here's my background, but <laughs> I don't know what you're doing with your work. I don't want to step on your toes. If you have something like this, this is your work. This is your story by all means. And he reached, like, he emailed me back and it was within hours. It was, it was just like, wow. give me a little bit of time to read it. Let me, you know, let me see what I can, you know, I don't have anything going on with it, but you know, so I got an email back a couple of days later. He's like, you know, I did not read your whole book. I'll be honest with you. I, I went through, but what I read, I absolutely love it. I love what you did. This is what I would wanted to do if I was not uh, near retirement and kind of past that chapter of my life and wanting to do, um, he goes, can I give you some constructive feedback? Yeah. 
Jim, like, this is your world. Like, absolutely. And he's like, well, you mentioned in there with microdosing, you know, being the amounts and this and that. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a moment, he goes. But for when it comes to uh, microdosing, he goes, what I find with, with LSD is you said, you know, 10 to 20 mics um, or 25 mics. He goes, but I find more of like 13 is kind of where I is kind of the happy spot. And he goes, <laughs> I know there's other people out there that will say that there's more and, and go with what they want to say. But this is based on my, you know, tens of thousands of reports <laughs> I've collected over and I'm going Jim, absolutely. Can I can I at least cite you in that in saying that he goes, oh please do, and I'm like, done. Okay, I, I, here you know, I, here I'm getting you know touched by, by the uh, the scepter here of of it. So it was very it was very uh, I was very appreciative of that. Yes. The the second part of the book is the um, is for providers, so it's more it's a little bit more in depth. Uh, it goes a little bit more into drug and the, the drug and drug interaction, medical considerations. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of go in and kind of get on a little bit of a soapbox a little bit and talking to providers like here's your patients coming to you talking about these things. Take that as a privilege. Mm -hmm. Feel, you know, because there's a study where it was only like 23% of people who were microdosing were even talking to their provider about it. It's and true. I was like, it is. Yeah. And I said to him, I, uh, so I said, you know, if people are coming and talking about it, if you're going to poo-poo their thoughts and and their own research, you're going to paint yourself and you're going to lose all of your rapport working with this person because they know what the research is. You, you know, spout off the, you know, this is your brain on drugs and you're going to, they're never going to believe you for a goddamn thing ever again. Yeah. Um, and I also give a bunch of resources for places for them to go learn, like the, um, psychedelic medicine association uh the psychedelic and pain association things like that uh and places for nurses to go learn like cias the um open nurses the entheogenic the organization of entheogenic and psychedelic nurses mm -hmm. um so there's a list of places so it was a handbook for them to be able to figure that out the third part of the book is a is a six-week microdosing journey it kind of looks at the it's kind of like a mini therapy, but it's not, I want to say. So it kind of looks at the uh, individual's place following like the sci the psychosocial, the social, biopsychosocial spiritual model, like okay. of healthcare. Like my background being a nurse, my um, undergrad was a holistic school of nursing where we really went into that uh, very in depth, and, you know, so I, being a nurse, you know, that's, we're treating the individual, not the, not the case. And that's kind of, you know, the difference when you go into a, uh, you see a doctor, an osteopath who's, you know, or orthopedic, uh, you know, broken leg. And in talking to them, they go, well, here's how to treat the broken leg, but nothing else. Like that is their, yes. you know, I'm treating someone who's got a broken leg. I'm treating, you know, how is the anxiety with it? How is it affecting your family? How are you doing with work? You know, the the whole individual. So I really mm -hmm. broke down that biopsychosocial model and kind of have people kind of looking at where are you at in, in this spot in your life right now? Where do you want to be in three months, six months? Where, you know, how can you have more connection with other people? And kind of just making people think about things a little bit different and in, in their interaction with everyone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I think that that six week, you know, that part of the book would be beneficial for anybody, not even if they're just microdosing anyone, if they're, you know, if they're on new antidepressants or they're just looking at, you know, a new self-care journey of yoga and health and whatever, you know, these are things to kind of really look at where are you at in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I believe everything's connected. So I'm glad that you kind of cover, you know, all of these different aspects. You can't just look at a broken leg. And I'd be like, it's just this. That's all that's, that's affecting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but medical care can just treat just that broken leg. And, it's and, true. And do really well with it. Yes. But but you're, that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, so in writing the book, you know, when I ended up going to my publisher, they were, one of the key complaints was it was too long. You know, and when I put Always. it together, I, well, I wrote it as a dissertation. You know, I wrote an APA format citing everything because okay. that's my background academically and they're like you don't need to cite everything you know you're the person that's telling people you can cut that out and i was like there's some stuff i can't really cut out i want people to be able to have and they're like 
oh, just cut down what that is. And mm. that cut out, like, just by taking out citations, cut out, like, 80 pages or something <laughs> crazy like that. Um, but the other complaint that the, that the publisher was, you know, they're like, we don't need, I don't think we need that second section for healthcare providers. People don't care about that. I go, that's the difference in the book. That's what makes the book what it is. You know, that mm -hmm. way the healthcare providers can have that sense of understanding and that other level. And, and they're like, if you can make it fit within you, please do. And I was like, challenge accepted. And I, and I made it work. Thank, thankfully, because I wanted it to be that book that you bring to your provider and go, here you're at, here's where I'm going with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, I've never really thought of that. Like having a book for the care providers compared to, you know, the people trying to learn about microdosing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a good yeah. aspect. Yeah. Have it like, you know, as a reference on your desk when it comes in and, and everything. And mm -hmm. yeah. So it was a, f yeah. It was a, so a funny story with, you know, saying my career suicide piece and, and all of that. Uh, so here I am, you know, new graduate nurse, first time ever, um, I don't have a, a, a I don't have my mentor with me. I I am a first day first psychiatric nurse practitioner with no oversight. My first patient I ever see, they come into my office, you know, and hi, introduce, you know, what brings you in today? I'm here, my my mood's down, my depression, my anxiety. Question, weird question for you. Do you know anything about microdosing? I was like, <laughs> actually, I do. What do you know? And they're like, well. Um, I know this and dosing and kind of going into like some of the details of it. And I was like, okay, she goes, so you said, you know, something about what do you know? I go, actually, I wrote a book on it. And she goes, you've got to be effing kidding me. I go, <laughs> no, she goes, where, how prove it to me? Where do I find it? I was like, well, it's not released yet, but if you go on Amazon, search my name. And so she gets on her phone. She goes, wow, Shit. that's a, that's a effing sign. I would go and in the back of my mind. I'm going. You're my first patient ever. Like that, that whole like uh, imposter syndrome and my committing career suicide is out the window. I never told her she was my first patient ever, but after I was like still doing the book and I was like, I need to add this story into somewhere. So I added it in wow. and she, she never mentioned and put two and two together, but it was kind of like that right place at the right time. And, and I was just like, this is amazing. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Little did she know. <laughs> Can yeah. you explain to the listeners the difference between microdosing and macrodosing? So, so yeah, so macrodosing, I'll start with macrodosing. Macrodosing is taking the large dose. It is the, when you hear people talking, you know, it's, it's now in the pop culture, you know, having uh, Anderson Cooper talking about it on, on TV, on CNN, uh, 60 Minutes is doing, you know, all these specials on it. So it is a large dose where someone is having a full psychedelic journey. You mm -hmm. know, they're having, you know, alterations in time and space and, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes a story going on in their head, <laughs> you know, the walls can be changing, whatever. Um, but they're having that full psychedelic experience. You know, which is typically about three and a half grams uh, or an eighth of mushrooms or starting around like a hundred micrograms of LSD. Um, you know, really changes someone's mind, changes their perspective. And in doing the, the macro dose, you know, there is encouraged to have that uh, integration phase to kind of, what did you take out of this experience? How can you make that as a part of your life? Where's mm -hmm. that going to go? And that's, I think that's the important part here. Um, when you see, you know, with the legalization going on in, in Oregon and in Colorado, where they're setting up the um, psilocybin uh, clinics, mm -hmm. that is, those places are generally giving a macro dose amount. Okay. Yep. Yep. Microdosing, on the other hand, is a small amount. So we're talking like 1 20th to 1 10th of a dose. Mm -hmm. So if we were looking at that, you know, doing the drug math out, it would be <laughs> roughly 0.1 to 0.4 grams of dried mushrooms mm -hmm. or 10 to 40 uh, milligrams is the amount. So we're talking a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Um, if someone is going about and doing that, it's such a small amount to be able to weigh that out, you know, theoretically the best place to go would be is like on Amazon and get like a jewelry scale. That's going to measure that tiny, tiny amount, like a, a, a scale that you're going to use for uh, cannabis or triple measuring weight. triple weight, um, measuring in your home to end up doing a um, 
food is not going to be, it's not going to be able to measure that tiny, tiny amount to it. Right. You know, so that's, that's the difference of the um, dosage amounts. Mm -hmm. So the ultimate, what you see with, with micro dosing is you're not having that being chased by dragons effect or, or walls dripping. What you're having is maybe things might seem a little bit brighter. Things might feel a little bit lighter. You feel a boost in your mood. Mm -hmm. It might change the way that you're thinking, the way that you see your world, get, breaking some of those rigid thinking patterns that we have, that canalization of, of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they say, oh, yeah, I've been macro dosing, people just kind of like assume it's a specific way. And then you're like, no, no, you're not supposed to feel it. That's not micro dosing. Uh, right. So, yeah, it's there's, a, I, I guess, a weird difference with the definition to some people. It well, and, and when it comes to the definition, you know, there's not a set definition. It's the, mm -hmm. but you know, typically it's the sub perceptual is what they say. But when you get into the higher ends and you start feeling a little bit lighter, uh, feeling a little bit um, different, mm -hmm. is that really sub perceptual in some ways? I, you know, I mean, that you're getting into uh, the verbiage of it, and it's, it, you know, it's interesting kind of way to go. Mm -hmm. But it, but theoretically, you know. Someone can go uh, microdose, go to work, go on with their day. Yep. They can go, um, you know, go into a meeting. No one knows that they're altered. You know, just like someone could go in and, and take a uh, SSRI medication and, and right. having improvements. Right. And do you recommend combining, like a lot of uh, research are, is saying, like combining that with lion's mane. Um, I think Paul Stammett says that and like niacin, like right. the three. Uh, yeah. what, what is your opinion on that? So this is the world where I would love to see research being done. Um, theoretically, it sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I'd like to see the difference. I, you know, my 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 school of thought in this is if it works for you, mm -hmm. God bless you. That, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. If you feel a benefit of of a bigger benefit by going and doing these other things, so be it. We just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my recommendation for people when it comes to microdosing in general is. Being consistent, tracking your amount, journaling it in some sort of way so you know how much you're taking day to day, mm -hmm. being consistent with, you know, if, if you're taking it every day and you don't drink coffee and then one day you drink coffee and you're feeling jittery, mm -hmm. note that. And that might be the difference of it. Um, what we see with microdosing is a lot of the um, side effects that people pers might have, the nausea. Uh, mm -hmm. sleep disturbance, uh, anxiety, things like that is often dose dependent. So, right. you know, my recommendation is similar to the old adage when it comes to cannabis, start low, go slow, work your way up. And if you notice these side effects, you know, what can you change about it? What can you kind of go around it? Um, you know, is there something you can add to it for like nausea? Can you add a little bit of a lemon tech where you end up putting a little orange juice with it? Because mm -hmm. with macrodosing, mm -hmm. it breaks down or lemon, um, mm -hmm. it breaks down a little bit. So it's a little easier on the stomach. Um, mm -hmm. But really noting these other changes with it. And the same thing, you know, comes when, you know, the question, like you said, you know, the stacking. I recommend that people kind of go about doing that and, and figuring out the lion's mane's pretty um pretty innocuous it's not someone can uh take it maybe they, they don't like the taste or something but it's not going to have any major physiological effects they're going to feel when you start getting in with the niacin mm -hmm. if anyone's ever taken niacin it's often in pre-workout it can, um, what it does is it opens up the blood vessels and the dilation so with that it can cause more uh itchiness um reddening of the skin mm -hmm. it can be it can be really annoying for some some people and uh, you know the more you're taking it the less bothersome it becomes but if someone you know mixes it all up and goes in and and takes starts taking microdose and now they're feeling flush and they hate it yes there's the there's that uh compounding factor in there that changes a little bit with it so mm -hmm. so with you know so the idea is with the stack like you said is the lion's mane ends up um, binding with it, it helps it get across throughout the body a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps to get across the blood brain barrier, getting into other parts of the brain. The niacin, like I said, opens up that flushing of the skin. So it gets okay. a little bit uh, more readily available throughout the body is kind of the, the, uh, the theory behind it. 
Okay. And I say theory because we don't have proof yet. Right. And I'm very hopeful for it. I, I And I believe that is the case, mm -hmm. but I can't say, you know, absolutely with 100% certainty because we just don't, oh, The one of the, the problems when we have like the Controlled Substance Act, it makes it so research is damn near impossible and, and cost um, drives the cost up. So mm -hmm. no one's able to do it. No one's able to do the research as well. Yeah. 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 I think uh, hopefully soon there'll be way more stuff on it. So that's a plus. And I think in your guidebook, there was something called a mood chart. Yeah. Did I, do you want to speak upon that? Yeah. So, the, so what I said, you know, part of the journaling and stuff and, and looking at it, um, I have a mood chart and I use this with my patients who might have bipolar disorder or mm -hmm. um, major depression, kind of like charting their mood. Cause you know, I see some patients, you know, every four weeks, every six weeks, every eight, uh, 12 weeks, whatever, and, you know, and when I start talking about their, how have you been doing, you know, they might remember the last week or the last two weeks, or maybe the, you know, more memorable is when something didn't go well. And it's kind of hard to, to, to track that, how have things been. So I have a mood chart um, in there. It kind of goes through and you kind of rate your day and in there, you know, Every day you kind of go and can, I think it's broken down to like plus five, negative five. So, you know, if you're taking these days and you kind of look at it and go, you know, I have a three day, three day, three day and four day, five day where mood is really high, but then, mm -hmm. you know, and then kind of correlates and kind of really track where you're at with your mood. And, you know, I, there's some space in there to kind of go where let's say, you know, you didn't sleep well because you're sick, you have a sick kid or you're dog's not doing well or mm -hmm. the holidays, you know, you put that in there and kind of go, okay, so I didn't have a good day here. Here's the other factors that are going on in my day. Is this because of the medicine? Is this not? And, you know, you have that correlation kind of going along and tracking how it goes and seeing where it's at. And it right. kind of gets really helpful, you know, with the, if someone's having a dosing schedule, um, you know, uh, you know, we mentioned that here in a second and correlating your dosing schedule with that and kind of see, uh, this is this a good day and how does that work with the microdosing? Mm -hmm. Does that answer the, the mood chart? Yeah, question? yeah, exactly. Yeah. What would like a, a recommended schedule look like for um, if you're trying to microdose? So I, the way I, I, I broke down, I talk in the book about the, the two main ones is the Fadiman and the Stamets protocols. I am a big fan of the Fadiman protocol myself. In doing that, it kind of gives you a chance to build a relationship with the medicine. Okay. Uh, so the Fadiman protocol basically goes day one, you microdose, you take, you take your dose, you know, journaling the whole thing with it. Day two, you don't take anything. You might have a little bit of what's, you know, referred to as like a um, honeymoon phase where things aren't that bad. The medicine's not really in your system, but there, you know, it still has a little bit of an effect on day three. You don't microdose as well. You know, whatever you had in your system is out, you know, theoretically it's probably your worst day of feeling out of the three because there's nothing there journaling. It's kind of, you know, I recommend with that is reflecting back what happened on day one. How did you feel with it? Did you have that jitters? Did you feel nausea? Did you feel whatever? And if you didn't feel anything or whatever, maybe it's worth going up on the next dose on day four with day four, you go up and you, you know, take the next dose and follow and kind of go. So you figure out what is working for you. Mm -hmm. it, it in interviews, you know, um, James Fadiman mentioned, you know, his idea with that wasn't really to have a protocol to, uh, for any specific reasons based on biology or anything like that, but it was kind of being able to do research on it to figure out with the people that are taking, you know, the citizen scientists, mm -hmm. what is working, what is doing and kind of having that, you know, figuring out what's working for you. And ideally, you know, when you have this and you figure out what your dose is at, where it works for you, you figure out, here's where I'm at. Here's what I need every day. And then many people, you know, will have, uh, you know, I, I have a six week, um, in the book, mm -hmm. some people might do four, some people might do eight, whatever, uh, encourage people to kind of take a little bit of time off for a short time to kind of reset, figure out mm -hmm. where they're at, see how it's going. And they might want to go back and do it again or whatever. But ultimately, you know, many people don't microdose 
following a protocol forever. A lot of people build that relationship with the medicine. I know people who will go and maybe do it once every fifth day, yep. once every seven days, once every two weeks, or mm -hmm. you know, if they're going to go to a, a concert uh, or something <laughs> and they want to be feeling a little clo more closer with people and more open to people and, and having that, they'll That's dose amazing. on those days. If they want to go on a, a hike in nature, you know, which which is where uh, Albert Hoffman talking about LSD is the best place to to uh, use. And I tend to agree, having yep. that connection with nature, you know, do it before those days and have that relationship of, of knowing. So really with that, with the, the Fadiman protocol, I encourage building a relationship and knowing, which is where it's so different from, you know, Western medicine of just taking your um, antidepressant or whatever the medication is, Yes. Every every day and it's working. Yeah, the, without journaling. Without journaling <laughs> and yeah. I like it when my patients do journal when they're taking the meds I prescribe, but yes. Mm -hmm. Um the, the the Stamets protocol is is a little bit uh different. Basically it's micro uh microdosing during the week to five days on, two days off. So microdose during oh. Monday through Friday or whatever works for you. Right. Um don't work. Don't take it on the weekends. Reset your receptors. Reset, you know, your mindset, and then doing it again. Mm. You know, if that works for someone, that's great. You know, that's awesome. But it's it feels for me. My bias of it a little bit is it seems more of like the Western medicine or just taking your medicine every day and yeah. and going from there. You know, if someone's doing it and 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 journaling with it and that works for them, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. It's whatever works for the person, you know, there's right. different strokes for different folks and, and yeah. that that's good. Yes. That, that's a good thing to have. But I like that when people have that relationship. Yeah. And everybody's different. So it's always going to be an individual yep. thing anyway. And so what I works agree. for one person is completely different. And that's where, you know, some people will say, this is how you need to do it. And it's like, this is what works for you and for other people, but not everyone's the same. Yep. Like a diet. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the future kind of looks like? Are you hopeful? Uh, yeah. Or, you know, what does the future kind of look like for you in this space as well? There's a few questions in there because, mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, if we're looking at, you know, what's the future here with psychedelics, I think mm -hmm. that uh, Pandora's box is open. Um, we're seeing it, you know, when we, when you turn on and Anderson Cooper's talking about it on TV, you know, when, when my parents are going, hey, I just saw this on TV, you know, did you catch this yet? Uh, you know, you know, it's becoming more uh, popular, you know, yep. which is awesome. It's great. It's decreasing the stigma and, and all of that. Um, my, you know, like I said, I've been in this space now for about six years or so. I would have never thought that we would be at this place that we're at now. Mm -hmm. I, I do have some, I don't want to say reservations, maybe some, uh, fears that maybe we're doing some stuff too fast too soon without knowing in some ways okay um that's fair i because you know we don't there's so many unanswered pieces to it i think that you know ultimately you know the social justice piece to it do i think that these substances should be legal absolutely there's no reason i think that people should have you know possession and then being locked in cages for up to you know the rest of their lives right. i think there's bigger bigger fish to fry there's bigger issues there mm -hmm. um and i don't mean that for and i don't want to say that's just with these substances i think that that is the case i feel for drugs in general the war on drugs has been absolute effing failure across mm -hmm. the board um if anything all it's done is weaponize um, individuals against each other, we yeah. you know, weapons of mass destruction and, and weapons of war are here on the streets for police to be able to police um, because of that. Um, there's so many overdose deaths that are happening. What we are doing is not working. And, mm. you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's where we're at, I think. So, yeah, so I think when it comes to you know, the decrib and legalizing and absolutely when it comes to the psychedelics in general, you know, and how are we going to apply it? There's so many unanswered things that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know some providers that are working above ground in Oregon and seeing some of the uh, challenges they're having with it um, and trying to figure out how to go about it is important to know. It's important to see. I think it's, you know, when we look at 
the research that's being done with psychedelics in general, you know, they're following oftentimes the protocols that came from Hopkins in 2008, the mm -hmm. safe practices, which are great for research. But when we start seeing these being applied in the real world, you know, we're going to have people who are using that might have um, specific drug on drug interactions that we don't know about. Then right. we're going to start seeing some of these changes that are going about it. Um, and I think that's where we need to figure it out. I, I, I'm glad that we're starting to see research being done um, outside of those protocols. Like, you know, there's a study coming out with individuals with bipolar that they're looking at. Because um, when you think of the, you know, the research being done, you know, it's the oftentimes the healthy normals. It's individuals who do not take any other medications as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't know that. Once it's open, you know, it's going to be the Wild West. And people are going to be able to prescribe whatever they want, however they want to do it, theoretically, unless however they the DA decides to write it. Mm. Um, we're going to see some stuff going on. And I hate to see, you know, these challenges then turn around and set us back a little bit further because people are like, well, I thought this was safe. Yeah. And, 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 and the narrative being changed in that way. Gotcha. When it comes to microdosing, where do I see this going? I, I'm excited to see it become more popularized more talked about um i'm excited to see there's some research um Con uh o'connor o'connor i can't think of his last name now he is doing some research with uh eegs and looking at brainwave scans with individuals who are taking microdosing okay um i think that we're going to start seeing more studies being done in that sense which is where i'm really excited to have proof because you know i i think of with individuals, like a lot of the research is done and I talk about it, is, is anecdotal evidence. Like it's, it's real world. It's people's, you know, people's stories going about it. And we're seeing individuals who um, broke their neck and regaining um, use of their legs and, and walking and stuff. We're seeing individuals I'm working with. Uh, uh, I work for a company remap therapeutics where we're doing uh, psilocybin journeys with individuals for chronic pain and there's some great research with individuals with chronic pain that are mm -hmm. out there that we're seeing um but at the end of the day you know that's all anecdotal evidence too as as well at this point i'd love to see some controlled studies with that um i just want to see it being knowing what's going on you know i i i tell a story one of my first uh, public appearances when my book came out i was doing a book signing and this woman came up to me and she was telling me about her husband who he had suffered a uh, right side stroke, so he lost the movement of his left side. Mm -hmm. He went through normal treatment um, with his doctors, um, PT, and, and with neurology. And they said, you know, basically at the end of the year, all the improvements that you have is about the best you're ever going to do. And they didn't accept that. And in not accepting that, she ended up obtaining chocolate bars online with mm -hmm. psilocybin and started microdosing. Mm -hmm. and, within a, and he also had a... The history of dementia with that with the dementia when anxiety goes up um it becomes more violent he was getting more irritated things like that so he was on SSRI medications that weren't mm -hmm. really helping he started microdosing he regained use of that left side he regained his ability to walk yeah you know ultimately this is anecdotal evidence there's no proof but right. in talking to her it was it, it was miraculous i taught someone else i was talking to their family member like their great aunt or aunt or something um, was in a nursing home end of life with dementia, not doing any better. They ended up getting and microdosing her. And now she is in Europe backpacking by herself. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't want to say that this is the case for everyone. I don't want to say, you know, this is what's going to happen, but these mm -hmm. are stories that, I, you know, in talking to them, I, I feel like I have a pretty good judge of sense of character when I talk to people. Like, right. I, I have to with my, with my profession. Yeah. And when people are telling this, I absolutely wholeheartedly believe what they're saying yeah. and I'm just going, holy crap. Like, yes. you know, with the low risk, high rewards that are there. Yeah. Why not for some people? Exactly. Why why not try it, you know? Yes. But ultimately this is anecdotal evidence. This is not proven. And I wanna see I wanna see, you know, the proof of it. Right. You know, unfortunately some I feel studies. when it comes yeah, when it comes to the studies of um so you know, I mentioned before the placebo effect and, and everything, you know. So the placebo effect, you know, is part of the clinical trials of giving a sugar pill or something that is inert, not doing anything and seeing improvements. Mm -hmm. Um 
a couple of studies that came out um, right before my book came out was looking at uh, microdosing and being no better than placebo. And with that, the second part was people that had, had higher expectations of better outcomes had higher expectations of, of better outcomes, regardless of microdosing or not. Gotcha. Hmm. Okay. So be it. Um, which is, you know, I, at the, ultimately at the end of the day, I don't care why someone's having improvement, but they're mm -hmm. having improvement, you know, and, and I went down the, the rabbit hole of, of the placebo research that's out there. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I found the work of Irving Kirsch. Okay. Um, so Irving Kirsch, it was a um, doctor who is in, I believe he is based in Boston and in doing research, what he did is he started looking at the rates of individuals um, with their outcomes with antidepressant medications. He authored a book in 2009, The Emperor's New Drugs. Um, what he did was, and why I like to tell people about this is, you know, I've been in academia for most of my life. I never learned about these studies until I went and found this out in my book. And I went back into school and I went, what the hell is this? Like, why are we not having this conversation? And it kind of, I had this existential moment with, with my career. Like, where are we, what are we doing with this? So what he did was when we have clinical trials for medications, what we really looked at was SSRI medications. So to be FDA approved, the, the medication needs to be significantly better than placebo. Okay. And it has to be done in two clinical trials. Easy enough, right? Okay. So what he did was he took the, and what they find is the standard is SSRIs work for, and I don't know the exact numbers. I'm going to say ballpark, 70% somewhere, 70, 76, somewhere in that area um, is with the, you know, the research that comes out where they start talking about the different medications. So Irvin Kirsch and his team went out and Freedom of Information Act, all of the clinical trials that were done on these medications and took the rest of the numbers. So the people that dropped out because of meds weren't working, people that dropped out because of you know side effects, whatever, they dropped out. So they aren't taking the medications. Mm -hmm. Took all of those numbers and put them back into, into the research. And in doing that, found that SSRIs had a efficacy rate in the 30s, 33, 36, 38, somewhere in there. Wow. Um, yeah. So what they found was individuals that had higher levels of depression had better outcomes, which makes sense. Right. Which is exactly what the research with placebo is, is showing as well. <laughs> so, so, so I kind of, so I was at a, a um, conference where I was talking about this and it was for a group of psychiatrists here in Maine. And one of the psychiatrists that was there, I knew who he was because he came out against the psilocybin legislation and, and was very open about it. And so he was like, during the question and answer, he goes, so we're, you know, with you're talking about placebo effect. Do we have a couple minutes? So I started citing this research and kind of talking about it. And ultimately I said, I, I was like, you know, I, I don't care why people improve. I don't care if it's the medications I have, it's the mm. changes that they're making in their lives, which have better outcomes. It, I don't care, you know, individuals who are taking SSRIs and doing psychotherapy have better outcomes comparatively anyways. Um, I, I Ultimately, I don't care, but we're seeing outcomes. Do we need to have a reason why is it the medication or not? Or can we just go with they're having these improvements? Mm -hmm. Going back to Kirsch's work, like, are you going to say that all the, the patients that you have that are having the improvements are based on that? Because research shows that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Do you care about that? Um, right. So really, I think it's important to kind of look at that and see that. The the interesting note with, with Kirsch's work after all of this, you know, this is after the Star Beach trial where they did a um, – multi-million dollar research over years comparing different medications and different treatments and came up with like this algorithm of, you know, if patients fail out of these ones, maybe go into these ones because they have more side effects and kind of looking out. And Kirsch's work changed um, with the outcomes. And as a result, we have not seen a federally funded research being done on 
medications and medications head to head or anything like that. Mm. All of the, all of the research that's being done now is, you know, is done by the drug companies themselves because they're not going to pour the money into it. So yep, makes sense. It, it, it makes sense. And it blew my mind. Like I had never, you know, read this working in psych and here I am prescribing, you know, like this, I think this should be better de disseminated to people, you know, and I'm not going out and saying meds don't work. I've right. seen miraculous recovery. I, I prescribe them literally every day <laughs> to people, you know, 99.9999% of my job is prescribing these medications. The psychedelics right. is a very small part. That's not even part of my normal. I believe in medications. Mm -hmm. They work for many people. Yes. They don't work for some people or the side effects don't work. And and if someone wants to go out and try using, you know, microdosing or something else and they're a good candidate and they're able to and having these effects, mm -hmm. I think it's worth a try cool. without having them being locked up in a cage. Right. Right. So you're kind of saying that um, if you're on specific, you know, SSRIs, but you also want to combine that with microdosing, is that safe to do or how would so you? Ultimately, research has shown, I guess this is where I'll start, that there is no there's not never been anyone that has had a serotonin syndrome from a result of using classic psychedelics out uh, I'm going to take out of here ayahuasca for a moment because that's a whole different and, and I can explain that in a second um but so drug on drug interactions there's never been a case with that uh that's happened they work on different pathways in okay. um, it's not uh, when SSRIs they increase the amount of ser free serotonin in the brain and mm -hmm. block the re up there's so SSRI is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it blocks yeah. the reuptake of the serotonin. So there's more of it inside the brain and floating around. Um, the way that uh, and the these medications work, the 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 psychedelics, is they work on that two A receptor mm -hmm. uh, versus SSRIs work on the one A receptor. Um, oh. So that's why the effects are a little bit different as well. And by bo increasing that. Uh, it's there, it's free floating, it has the physiological effects that are going about, but it doesn't amount, increase the amount of serotonin and it doesn't decrease the amount of serotonin being coming out. Okay. So it's a completely different way of it working. It's a different pathway. It's a different way of going about it. Um, I think that if we saw anyone that had a serotonin syndrome as a result of microdosing or macrodosing with or without medications, it would be published in a moment Okay. with, with the, with the movement that we're seeing and how fast we're going. And I, I think any researcher would love to have that as a, you know, hi, I told you so type of thing, but we're not mm -hmm. seeing that. We haven't seen it. Okay, so, good. You know, am I saying that is absolutely not going to happen? No. Right. But the, you know, the, the risk is, is, is minuscule at best of what we're seeing at this point. Well, good to know. Awesome. Yeah. When it, so I was going to say with the ayahuasca, where yes. I mentioned that ayahuasca is an ad. Um, so it has both the, uh, the DMT that's there for it to become orally activated in the stomach. It has to have a MAOI inhibitor, which the inhibitor prevents the breakdown, which is, which is why the MAOI cannot be taken with uh, SSRI medications or numerous other medications, why there has to be a, di a dieta, a uh, proper diet going into it gotcha. to prevent that from happening. So it's a whole different thing. So when people ask me, you know, can I microdose uh, ayahuasca or what? Like my book is not necessarily there for that because it is different in that sense. Got it. Now there are certain medications that can, um, maybe decrease the efficacy of, of microdosing because sometimes they do act on that serotonin 2A receptor. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's some of the uh, antipsychotic medications. There's some uh, couple of antidepressant medications, one of which is trazodone, which is used for sleep. Um, so when I have someone who's microdosing and they happen to be on trazodone, I, you know, I recommend don't maybe take your trazodone for sleep the night before or two days before you're microdosing. Yeah, so true. it's not in your system. So you're actually getting it. Um, and there's a couple of others and I mentioned them in the book there, but ultimately it's safe, but safe, but oftentimes it just might decrease the efficacy of, of the medicine. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah that's, Does that answer? that's, yeah, that's perfect. Perfectly put. Yeah. Thank you, CJ, for coming on today. I really enjoyed our chat and I feel like I learned so many things. So thank you for uh, coming on and let people know where they can find your book or follow you or find you. Yeah. So my book is the microdosing guidebook. Um, 
a step-by-step -step manual to improve your physical and mental health through psychedelic medicines. It is available anywhere that books are available. So I encourage people, you know, any small town, small business bookshop can get it because it is uh, available through uh, Simon & Schuster is distributing. And I recommend people going there, A, to support small business, but chances mm -hmm. are they're going to order, if they're going to order one in for you, they might order three more to put on the shelves. I don't have, uh, you know, I'm trying to do this myself and, and, you know, there's a lot of books out there. So it's not that, you know, popular. It is also <laughs> available on Amazon. Um, if you choose to go there, please leave a review if you like it. Uh, I highly appreciate it. Barnes and Noble, Chapters, Indigo, all of those places have it. Yeah. Uh, my social media is, uh, I'm, I go by the term, the entheo nurse. Uh, so entheo meaning the healing from within with, uh, that is my, um, on X or Twitter or whatever they call it this week. Uh, <laughs> I have a, a Facebook, uh, presence on as in Theo nurse. The only one I, d um, don't really use for that is my Instagram is the underscore in Theo nurse because my old one was hijacked. Um, and someone took it and everyone should use double factor authenticity for it yeah. to prevent that from happening because that's happened. So yeah, available anywhere for it. And uh, thank you. So we all like drinking, right? Or at least drinking a little bit or, you know, you know, people that go out and party a little too hard. I'm, I'm a culprit of that too. I like to have a couple drinks with my friends, my family, but I always feel like I regret it the next day or, you know, you have some digestion problems, you get hungover, you get really sluggish and you kind of waste the next day. Am I right? So I've been using Z-Biotics probably before I even interviewed them for my podcast. So it's actually a prebiotic drink that you're taking prior to drinking to ease the hangovers. So this is kind of what the package would look like. I like to get the 12 pack because it lasts me a few months. So what it is, it's a prebiotic drink. So you're taking this cute little bottle here and you're just opening it and taking it as a shot. So you're sh taking your shots before your shots. You follow me? In here, it's a genetically modified bacteria that actually is designed to eat up a seed alcohol or the negative aspects to drinking. So that's kind of what the science is, kind of behind the scenes of what Z-Biotics is. So thank you to Zach and the rest of the research team have made this amazing, amazing little beverage that you have prior to drinking. And I usually don't want to waste my full day the next day. I like to go to the gym. I still want to hang out with people. I still want to be able to, you know, do real things the next day. So that's what Z-Biotics has really helped with. It's just something that I can know that I'm getting a better night's sleep. I have better digestion the next morning. Make sure you drink responsibly. This is not something that you can just now you know, get wild with it. But it is it is a little crutch. It is something that could be very helpful to people. Um, you might just notice when you wake up, you just don't feel as exhausted. You don't feel as tired. Uh, you just kind of feel a little bit better than you would if you did not have Z-Biotics. So that's how you'd use it. You just kind of take it before your first drink. My mom likes to sneak mine all the time, so now I put her on to ordering her own because even if I just have two drinks, I still could have negative effects the next day. I have rheumatoid arthritis, so drinking is kind of a no-no for me, mm, but I still like to have fun. I still want to drink a little bit. So this is something that has really, really changed me. Another thing that I love about their uh, company is that they have a really good text program. So if your order is coming up and they're about to ship to you, they send out a text prior to when they're going to ship it to you. And 
it's so, it's so great because they have little uh, prompts where you can modify, you could cancel, you could skip the next order. So it's all done by texting. Give it a try. I really believe in this product. Even if I didn't have, even if I wasn't partnered with them, I would still be using it. That's actually why I hit them up is like, hey, I love your products. I use them every time I drink. Even if I just have one, maybe two drinks, I still like to use it. So have this drink before you have all of your other drinks and you are good to go. If you want to try me out, try out Zbiotics and just, you know, see what it's like. Uh, use the code FLORA10 for 10% off. That is F-L-O-R-A 10 for 10% off. Thank you, Zbiotics. I absolutely love you.